the best coaches in the game, haha, <laughs> we really ain't playing We regroup up in the slack chat where the coaches debrief We be piecing these puzzles, occupy the chunk of the pie Ain't no lie when we hit the block, helmets casket is top You be seeing helmet after helmet, helmet after helmet First place, second place, fifth place, eighth place, twelfth place, fifteen, sixteen, twenty So many helmets, you got blur vision, we got too many Hello race fans, and welcome to Tacos Fast 40 Presented to you by DFSArmy.com uh, we're going to be talking about the spring, well, supposed to be the spring, but the summer Homestead race here coming up on Sunday at 3.30 Eastern Time. Uh, and that's going to uh, be in a real busy stretch of races. We've got four races in two days. Uh, we've got back-to-back -back Xfinity races, uh, so that should be really interesting. Of course, it's going to cause a lot of chalk in that second Xfinity race, just going off of who was fast in those races. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on the Cup Series race, uh, the uh, kind of untimely named Dixie Vodka 400. Um, but yeah, before we get into this race, of course, I've got to let you know that at DFSArmy.com, sign up with us today using promo code TACO. I get access to the research station, which I will be referencing throughout this podcast. And, uh, of course, our Domination Station lineup optimizer. And, of course, that won't just include NASCAR. You get access to all of our sports, you know, covering uh, Korean baseball, uh, Turkish soccer, Chinese esports, you name it. We cover it. Call of Duty, Rocket League, all that good stuff. All included in your DFS Army VIP subscription package, which, of course, you can uh, get a 20% off lifetime discount using promo code TACO. And they'll obviously support me and the podcast here. Um, so yeah, go do that. That's you know that's a pretty important part of this uh, whole thing. Uh, so yeah, Homestead Miami Speedway. Uh, it's, it's an oval. Uh, it's one of the only just straight up ovals that we have. It's kind of hard to describe that, but um, yeah, we don't have... It's not, it's not D-shaped. It's not a tri-oval like most of the other one-and-a-half-mile tracks. Uh, so that is pretty interesting there, along with the progressive banking. Kind of makes it how it is. The outside line here, very much preferred. And, um, you know, historically, a lot of these numbers aren't going to add up to the race that we're going to see on Sunday. Uh, you'll notice last, last week, uh, the Martinsville race. Crazy race. A lot of the chalk guys were just horrible. You know, Kyle Busch, who historically had been absolutely insane at all short tracks for the last several years, especially with the low downforce package, uh, his car, his setup did not hit at all, and then he hit someone and uh, caused some damage. Of course, all the Toyota struggled, uh, but you had, at the same time, a Toyota winning in Martin Truex Jr., uh, just because it's a night race, and that's what he does at night races, I swear. Uh he, he was struggling right with them, got some damage, sawzalled it, <laughs> got back out there, and of course he had a fast car by stage three, because that's how Martin Truex Jr. be doing. Um, but yeah, here, this is, uh, it's going to be so weird this week. Uh, it's going to be very similar to Martinsville, as in we've, we first off, we've never had a homestead race, at least in a long time, in, you know, the summer. When it's very hot, usually this race takes place in November. It also means that last race here, albeit the championship race, it wasn't that long ago, you know, compared to some of these other tracks, uh, like Atlanta, that we hadn't been to in, you know, forever, like over a year. So, you know, this was the last race of the final, of the uh, the season, of course, and that's going to change a whole lot about how this race goes down. So. I've never been as against uh, track history in almost any race than, uh, than this one right here. I think that track history is going to be almost useless to look at here. And the reason is, this is usually the championship race. It makes everybody drive differently. You've got the championship four, which last year it was uh, Hamlin, Truex, Harvick and Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch ended up winning the race, winning the championship. Um, 
You're going to have guys like Kyle Busch, like Kevin Harvick, that have just absolutely insane track history here. Um, usually it's because they're part of that final four. And the rest of the field, the other 36 or 35, 34 drivers, uh, they tend to give a lot of respect to those guys because they don't want to be the guy responsible for ruining someone's championship run. And that's evident in the stats here. Uh, it's one of the it's one of the most uh, green flag, uh, caution free races that we have. Uh, there are some cautions, but we don't see a lot of cars going to the garage. You know, we see like this is the track where uh, more people complete seventy five percent of their laps. Ninety six percent of people historically have finished seventy five percent of their laps than at any other track. Uh, this is it ranks fourth in average percentage of laps finished, um, and yeah, that's gonna. I think that'll change because, again, not only are the the non playoff drivers gonna be driving this differently, uh, you know, historically here, but also the playoff drivers themselves. They're gonna race a little bit differently than they would this race here, where they're racing for you know playoff points and racing to win. Here, I mean, oftentimes we've seen winning just being, you know, finishing fourth with the, you know, all the other guys finishing behind you. There's no actual need to win the race, you know. So there hasn't been a need to, like, push it for some of these guys. You know, they're going to want to just finish against the other four. They're doing a completely different race than uh, what the kind of race we'll be seeing on Sunday. Uh, so just a completely different style of race we're going to see and you know this is this is historically a one groove kind of racetrack i mean you start out runs running on the inside and then you'll move up with the progressive banking because it's fastest on the outside very much a kyle larson track and kyle larson historically is dominated here in the xfinity series in the nascar cup series that's why I always thought that Larson would be a decent bet, at least the last few years, to snag a championship just because if he ever were to make the Final Four, um, he was one of the best at Homestead. Uh, he's dominated several times. He has the two highest fantasy point scores here since 2013. He scored 115 and 123 fantasy points in 2016-2017 leading 132 and 142 laps in those two races. I mean, he's crushed here. But, of course, he's not in this race. Matt Kenseth will be replacing him uh, for the time being. And he's also someone that's been really, really good here. Always finishes top 10 here historically. He's won a championship here. But, again, a lot of that is going to go right out the window. I think we're going to want to look... Uh, at what guys have been doing since the return. Um, and we can especially look to last week at Atlanta, honestly. Um, this is another older kind of tire wear, quick fall off sort of track. It's another 1.5 mile oval. Of course, the different, kind of a different shape than the others. Uh, but one thing you can do here that Larson was always a big fan of is ride right against the wall. And that's gonna be a risk reward kind of scenario. Usually, if you're if you're out in clean air or whatever, you're not going to want to run the wall. It's it's very risky. You'll just want to run the outside lane, nice and safe. But if you need to catch up, if you need to make up some time, you can ride right up against the wall. And this is one of the best tracks for it, if not the absolute best track for that. Besides, maybe um, maybe old Bristol, old Bristol. You definitely had to do that. Kind of reminds you of one of those races. Um, yeah, this is a 267 lap race, so it's going to have half of the number of laps as we saw on display last week, but it is going to be similar to last week because, again, Martinsville moved from a day race to a night race, and of course, this race becomes, or this race goes from a championship race to just a regular race in the middle of the season in much, much hotter temperatures. So there's going to be less grip. Um, and yeah, there's. Probably, it's probably going to be a little bit chaotic, and you probably will see some guys just straight up miss their setup. Uh, so we kind of learned from last week 
maybe it's best to try and avoid some of these chalk guys. Um, and, you know, with this package, honestly, a lot of guys are just going to get lucky. They're going to get clean air. They're going to get the first, uh, you know, they're going to come first off pit row. They're going to basically dominate, not from their on-track performance, but from their pit crew's performance. Uh, so the guys have had really good pit crews so far this year, uh, like Harvick, uh, like Chase Elliott until recently. Um, guys like that are going to have a bit of an advantage here. And um, yeah, other than that, it's a lot of unknown. So you might want to drift away from the chalk. Lately, that has kind of been the move with no practice times. You know, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this is guesswork when it comes to the setups. Some guys will hit it. Some guys will completely miss the mark. Uh, sort of like we saw last week. Of course, we won't see the top guys go several laps down as easily as we saw last week with guys like Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin. Uh, even Blaney got lapped by Logano, even though he would uh, ultimately end up you know, coming back and, and flying past him, almost winning the race in the end. Uh, so that, that was kind of interesting to see, but we won't see that this week. Um, you know, the guys getting lapped are going to be the back half of the field for the most part. Your dominators will stay on the lead lap. And uh, another historical thing real quick before we dive into the 40. Um, this has been one of the worst tracks of all to play uh, the pole sitter. Unlike last uh, the last few weeks where the pole sitter has been OP, like Martinsville, the number one uh, place to play pole sitters. This has not been a very good place to play pole sitters. Um, I don't know, there are probably several reasons for that. Uh, but I don't think that it will be quite as bad for the pole sitters here. But at the same time, you know, some... Uh, all we have to go off of really are some of these historical trends. Um, but, of course, that'll matter less this week than at almost any other race that I've covered. Um, so ownership's going to be very important. Very hard to get a... Very hard to figure out ownership this week. You know, you've got... It, it's hard to know if people will um, just be following optimizers and... I don't, know if, I don't know if a lot of the optimizers are going to take in a lot of track history into account, historical trends. Um, you'll see with Kyle Busch, he's kind of the, the number one example of what's kind of, what's really hard about this slate. So historically, if you look at, you know, dominator stats, lead laps, fast laps, uh, be it, you know, last year at one and a half mile tracks, you know, he averaged uh, the second most lead laps of anybody in the entire field at 34. Uh, over the last three races at Homestead, he averages 70.5 lead laps. That's more than anyone. Um, you know, historically, 32 average lead laps um, at Homestead. But, you know, this year he has averaged one lead lap at one and a half mile track so far. He has been struggling. Uh He's had some success at some short, uh, shorter tracks so far this year. Phoenix, Bristol. Uh, one and a half mile tracks, he's been struggling. So, you know, are people going to play him because he's very underpriced uh, compared to how Kyle Busch would normally be uh, with this kind of setup here? Uh, we saw last week he was overwhelming Chalk and he ended up failing for a lot of people. Um, I don't know how many people are going to be burned or notice, you know, eh, maybe not playing Kyle Busch. Like, I'm kind of leaning towards that. And, you know, getting away from the track history, you know, he has multiple wins here and all pretty much all top five finishes. But a lot of that could be due to him pretty much always being in the championship race. I don't know. So ownership's going to be hard to project. Honestly, I have, usually I'm fairly confident in the ownership projections. This week it's going to be very hard to nail down it's I'd, i'm not entirely sure where everyone's going to go it will be interesting to see you know we've got a really unsavory play uh on the pit or on the uh on the pole position here denny hamlin who's actually fin actually started on the pole here uh several times let me pull up his uh, uh historical stats here um yeah he, he started uh on the pole in 2019 and in 2018. Uh, last year he led two laps. <laughs> and yeah, that was it. Uh, also in 2017, so the last uh, three years actually. 
He started on the pole. He's also started on the pole here in 2015. So in those four starts from the pole, he's finished 9th, 10th, 10th, and 12th. And only once did he lead significant laps. That was in 2018 when he led 41 laps. Ultimately ended up with 43 fantasy points. Pretty much he's been a dud every time. People are always attracted to the pole sitter. You know. I don't know. It, for some reason, Hamlin was way higher owned last week than I thought he would be, especially on FanDuel. He was like insane chalk over there. That blew my mind. I don't understand that. Ownership's been very funky. You know, I can. It's usually very easy to predict who people are going to play when it's just the regulars. But with all the public... Uh, you know, the public tends to play more of these cup races. Man, it's it's been weird just who people are piling on to. I think a lot of people are just, you know, plugging in optimizers and letting them roll. Um, so this week I want to kind of discourage that. I know I've got, you know, some carefully thought out projections in the domination station, but I would heavily edit those based on your personal preference, I think, this week. A lot of different ways things could go. There's some guys that I've projected higher that I only I'm not even a big fan of myself. Mostly looking at Kyle Busch there. I don't think I'm going to be on Kyle Busch this week. And there's nothing you can do. Harvick is going to project out insanely high here. I think, yeah, like six more fantasy points than anyone else. You know, him and Truex seem to be by far the best two plays here, and they are priced correctly. I don't know if I'm 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 still de- I'm still deciding on Harvick, but. You know, let's get right into the field here. Let's start off with the most expensive guy, or Kev- Kevin Harvick, at eleven thousand eight hundred dollars. Um, easily had the best pit crew so far this year, constantly stealing spots in pit road, and he's uh, yeah, he's just been crushing it. You know, averaging seventy five point eight laps led at one and a half mile tracks so far this year. That is over double of anybody else. Uh, averages thirty one fast laps as well. Uh, per 267 laps, and you know we have uh, you know for this week on the research station we have each stat broken into uh, six different um, sections here. Let me talk about those real quick. You got the Homestead recent, so that's the last three years. But really, you kind of want to look at. Uh, well, I don't. Know. I'm not really looking at these stats as much. The Homestead stats. I'm kind of ignoring them a lot more than I usually would. But usually, I'd look at. Uh, just this year and last year, because that's the uh, the 550 horsepower package we just started last year. So the 2019 stats are going to be a lot more valuable than uh, the other years. Uh, it's a bit different than the short track uh, package where we ignore last year and look at 2017-2018. Uh, so it's always important to remember that. Um, we've also got 2021 and a half mile stats. That's going to be one of the main ones we're focused on. And the 2019 one and a half mile tracks. Um, just important to remember, you know, who was fast last year in this package first debuted. Then we've got the core, uh, the correlated tracks, and the steep tracks. Real quick, I might as well go over the uh, the highest correlated stats uh, tracks. By far, number one is Richmond. Makes a little bit of sense. You know, it's another track where the the outside's kind of preferred. Kind of very single file, straightforward, but um, by far the highest correlated track, followed by Phoenix, actually. Um, it's very interesting. You got tracks like Michigan, Loudoun, Kansas, Bristol, Auto Club, Darlington, Chicagoland, coming out as the highest correlated track, just mathematically. Um, so that's kind of interesting to look at. I like keeping that in mind, just comparing with the others. And then, of course, the steep tracks. Uh, makes a lot of sense. The uh, the progressive banking here uh, goes about like 24 degrees, uh, sort of like you know Charlotte, sort of like Atlanta, and what tracks we've been to very recently. Darlington also another steep track. So we've been to a lot of steep tracks recently, and that should make for some good corollaries. Of course, those I think those are going to be more important to look at than the flat ones like the Kentuckys of the world. You know, they, they just race a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, you've got that to look at, and yeah, I'm mostly looking at this year's one and a half mile stats, uh, but keeping all the other uh, splits we've got in mind. Um, yeah, you look to this season, and obviously Harvick's been the best. Uh, there's no doubting that. Pretty much number one every stat at these one and a half mile tracks this year. 
And he has six straight top four finishes here. So the track history is immaculate. Um, you know, averages the most lead laps historically of anyone in the field. Uh, probably because Larson is not participating. I think he would be number one uh, otherwise. So I think he's going to be potentially the highest owned play. I think definitely the highest owned stud. Um, I could see Bowman and Custer challenging him in overall ownership, but I think there's a pretty good chance that, uh, you know, odds on favorite Kevin Harvick, I think it's easy to pay for him this week. And I think a ton of people are going to go there. And then you've got Martin Trex Jr. behind him at 11-4. And I think he'll be the second highest owned stud. And there'll be a probably a significant drop off after that. Uh, so not too much to say about Harvick. Um, he seems to be faster on short runs than longer runs. Uh, his, his thing has basically been, if you get him out in clean air, he is gone but he has struggled a bit in traffic. So there's definitely a case to fade him. If you want to fade Harvick this week, go against the chalk. That's probably a pretty strong move to make in GPP. A uh, safe play would be just to play him because he's you know, statistically the best player we've got here. And then for Truex, he just won. Right? Won last week at Martinsville. Very impressive race. Um, you have 3.30 start time. It's another afternoon into the evening race, man. It's hard... It's hard to doubt Truex. Last three years, he's finished uh, with a win and two runner-up finishes in a row. Uh, so the history here is insane. But other than that, you know, averaging 22 lead laps, uh, 22 fast laps at one and a half mile track so far this year. I actually struggled significantly last year with the change in package. I think it was a lot better in the uh, 750 horsepower package at one and a half mile tracks. He was undoubtedly number one. Uh, it's taken a little bit of a step back there, uh, but it's really, really hard to count Truex out. Starting fifth, very likely Dominator. At any point, I would not be surprised if he's fast. So you gotta have some of him. Um, but I don't know, he's, I'll probably just be like even weight to the field on him. That's probably how I'm going to approach it. He's coming in right behind Harvick. Uh, Harvick's 4.5 to 1. Truex is 5 to 1. Uh, so right behind him as the favorite. And, you know, right in behind Kyle Busch, who I think is overpriced on the books here, just with his struggles. Truex has not been struggling as much as the other JJR cars. Uh, so those two, they make sense as like the stud chalk. Then you've got Chase Elliott at $11,000. Um, has struggled here. He's never led a lap. But of course, he's never been in playoff contention either. So, you know, he's a really he's a really nice guy, just respectful, rides around there. Um, now, this year at one and a half mile tracks, you know, last year he averaged 10 lead laps per race. This year he's averaging 31. You know, 12 fast laps per race last year, 22 this year. Obviously much improved. Uh, should have more wins than he has currently. He's given up a few, like at Charlotte. Uh, ended up, you know, running it back and winning at Charlotte. But you know, outside of a wreck in Darlington, uh, he's been really solid. Could have been better at Atlanta. It was, you know, I don't know, Atlanta is always kind of underperformed at his hometown race. Uh, sort of like how uh, the Bush brothers, for some reason, underperform at Las Vegas, their hometown race. Uh, I don't know if there's anything there, but yeah, he's been one of the best cars she doesn't have the history here. I'm okay with uh, not caring about that. I think he's significantly improved. I think Hendrick has proven uh, this season that they have taken a giant leap forward. Uh, and Chase has led the way. And he's made himself a factor in every race. Uh, even if it's just him sneaking up there and going, wow, how did he get to the top five? Like he did that last week. Uh, even though it wasn't very impressive at all. Uh, so Chase Elliott, going to be a top kind of play for me. Um, I keep saying last week, but it wasn't even last week. It was like a few days ago. <laughs> uh, this schedule's crazy. But yeah, I like Chase Elliott a lot here. You know, even though the historical stats on him are not great, I hope that he keeps his ownership down. Priced up really high at 11k. Don't mind it too much. Seven to one to win. I, I don't mind 
uh, using some Chase Elliott maybe to uh, get away from some of the junior, uh, Truex Jr. <laughs> Definitely don't want to call him Jr., uh, but the Truex Jr. and the Harvick chalk there. Um, and he came in like insanely low owned last week. I know he was overpriced at like 11.5, and that was a short track and all, but another track that he struggled at historically, and his ownership is like 12%. Uh, so I see him breaking 20% here, but just barely, maybe, maybe right around 20%. Uh, so I, I would like to be overweight on Chase. Then you've got Joey Logano at $10,700. Um, he has dominated here historically over the last three years. He's averaged 40 lead laps, uh, winner in 2018 when he won the championship, um, starting runner up, you know, starting second to Hamlin. You know, if Hamlin fails to lead laps off the pole yet again, um, I could see Logano easily taking off. You know, he crushed last week, obviously. Um, really, he's been crushing, like, kind of low-key this year. His finishes have not been great at all. Look at his dom points at one-and-a-half mile tracks. You know, percentage of dominator points has gone his way. Uh, over the last four at Atlanta, Charlotte, and Darlington, you know, 6%, 11%, 3.5%, and 7% of the dominator points go in his way. And they're not fast laps. He does struggle with getting fast laps. And that's one thing that you have to know with Logano. If he doesn't find the lead, which he's very good at finding and has been finding a lot more at this package, uh, but if he doesn't find the lead, he usually doesn't make value because uh, he's priced up and he doesn't get fast lap points compared to some of the other guys who are going to finish top five. Uh, very likely finishes top five. I think he has, like, yeah, he has five straight top six finishes here. Uh, of course, a lot of them are in contention because uh, he's really good in the playoffs, uh, unless Matt Kenseth takes him out. But yeah, Logano, he's got to be a top dominator for me. Definitely like him over Hamlin, who I guess we should talk about here. Hamlin has. He struggled with some finishes, like his average running position so far this year at one and a half mile tracks is at a 10, right even at 10. His average finish is 15. So I think more than anyone else, uh, he's right there with Jimmy Johnson as the guy that's been running way, way better than he's finishing. Uh, so his, his finishes do not look as good as they kind of should, I guess. He does have the win at Darlington, the runner-up at Charlotte, but... He's had some, you know, before the break, he had a really, really tough time at Las Vegas and Homestead. Uh, you know, a lot of top fives and stuff since then. And, you know, he's, he's usually a guy that's running up there, but not uh, not leading laps, just like his teammate, uh, Kyle Busch. So, you know, just part of the, the Team JGR struggle bus. And, you know, what can I say about him? Fourth straight year in the pole. He's yet to dominate. I don't think he's going to dominate again. His best finish in the last uh, five years here is ninth. I know he won in 2013, but um, obviously he wasn't in contention then. Um, I don't know. Part of me wants to play him because his track history is so bad. And, you know, with the preferred land and all, you know, be able to start on the inside at least to begin. I uh, should theoretically check out ahead of Logano. I still see Logano taking it more than Hamlin does. Um, and I don't know. I'm just, it's, if I knew that Hamlin was going to be really popular, I would avoid him. If I knew a lot of people are going to be off of him, I'm not sure how many people realize he's been on the pole here four years in a row and has sucked pretty much every time. Uh, if people are going to be avoiding him, then I might want to be on him, but it's kind of a hard sell for me. He's not crazy overpriced this week like he was last week, but I don't know. Not not big on him. 10-1, to 1, even with the pole. Not impressive. Uh, and you've got Kyle Busch. Kind of talked about him a lot already. 10100 Very good price for him. Um, you know, just looking at last season, uh, you know, recent finishes at Homestead and stuff. He has the best stats. Uh, average running position of third. Over the last three years here. Average finish of two and a half. Uh, 70.5 lead laps. Um, yeah. Obviously the dude is dominated and crushed here. Consistently. 
and his odds to win are much bigger than Hamlin or Logano, but I don't really see it. Again, has not led much of anything so far this year, and you know completely missed the setup last week. I get it was a different package. Uh, just not a great look for Mr. Kyle Busch. His struggles have been uh, quite clear, but his average fantasy points per game look pretty good because of all the domination at like Phoenix and Bristol. Uh, so it's not it's not too obvious, but I don't know. It, it really comes down to if the optimizers are forcing in Kyle Busch or not. If the optimizers are just handing out a crap ton of Kyle Busch to people, then of course I want to fade the crap out of him. Uh, I'm still going to fade him overall, but I don't, if people if he's going to come in super low owned, like under 20% or something, I might be um, you know, I might feel a little bit of the FOMO there, but I'm not too worried about Kyle. I'm going to assume that he continues to struggle and just hope that uh, people are overvaluing his historical stats here and at this track type because this year it's just been, uh, the struggles have been insane. Seven fast laps per race. That is not Kyle Busch level. Last year was 27. Just obvious struggles there. Don't like Kyle Busch. Uh, and then Jimmy Johnson, ridiculous price last week and then Damn near dominated the race. I think he ended up in the optimal still. Insane. Insane. I I, I was very against him. I think everyone was. End up super low owned. And of course he ended up uh you know finding his way out there at a track that he had won at nine times before. And where where do you win championships at? Jimmy Johnson has won seven of them. And yeah, you win championships here at this track. Now recently, outside of a win in 2016, when he won his Miracle Championship, um, he has no finish better than ninth since 2013. Um, no lead laps, pretty much at all. Even when he won the race in 2013, didn't lead for crap. But look back historically any farther than that in the last gen of car, and it's all Jimmy Johnson. Um, Jimmy was saying that he was looking all the way back at his 2008 setup for last week, which I think is pretty funky, but obviously whatever he was doing back then worked big time. And for some reason it seemed to work out. I'm not saying that's going to apply here. I'm still very much against playing Jimmy here. Starting in ninth, I don't see him dominating. Um, I, of course I didn't see him dominating last week and that was a surprise, but, um, I know that Hendrick has improved a lot. I wouldn't, Maybe I wouldn't be as shocked to see him up there. Uh, I think he's going to finish in the top 10. Don't get me wrong. I just don't see him as having the dominator upside as some of these other guys. Um, if you could prove me wrong here. But I I'm not really going to gamble with Jimmy this week. He's still kind of crazy overpriced in my mind. Uh, and then you've got Brad Keselowski at $9,500. I don't know why DraftKings has been hating on him and Blaney so much. I mean, the pricing difference in these Penske guys are insane. You know, they kind of tend to run as a pack more than almost any other team in NASCAR. I'd say for sure uh, that they run as a 1-2-3 pack way more often than any other team in NASCAR. I, I think I'm very confident in saying that. So I don't know why they're priced so differently, but $9,500 when Logano is 10700 It's a little crazy to me. And he starts right behind Logano in third place, and... He does not have the historical stats here uh, that Logano has, only averaging 14 lead laps per race, none in the last three years. And, you know, this year he hasn't been as impressive as Logano at the one-and-a-half-mile tracks either. I know, you know, they both get uh, very low numbers when it comes to fast laps. Actually, Keselowski's got more fast laps. Uh, he's averaging 17 lead laps. A lot of those were gift-basketed to him as well, so I think that's a little bit overrated. He is really good at uh, the correlated tracks and the steep tracks. Maybe something to keep in mind. Um, his, his average finish is significantly better than his average running position. And that's just, that's Keselowski for you. Him and Kurt Busch are so good at finishing better than the, their car was fast. Like, if they have an eighth place car, they can put it like second or third. They just have that, that skill. Always have. That's just the M.O. of Brad Keselowski. And, you know, if Chase is leading late, I wouldn't be shocked if he gift wraps Keselowski a third win this season because uh, he's he's been just handing out wins to Brad left and right. Uh, so 
Don't mind him for such a cheap price, $9,500. I don't know if he'll be popular or not. I was thinking about this long and hard uh, when adjusting some of the ownership projections. People have been playing him a lot. Like last week, he was very, very popular, but his track history was just insane. Um, not the craziest track history here. You know, some top five finishes, but no real domination or anything. Um, I don't even think he's won here before outside of maybe his uh, 2012 championship. So I don't, I don't think people are going to be like 40 plus percent of them like they were last week, up to like 50 percent. But uh, he'll still garner some ownership just because of the price. And he looks a lot better on paper than the next option we're going to talk about. Uh, man, since uh, since this whole no practice, no qualifying uh, thing post-break, uh, DraftKings has been, you know, score or they've been, uh, they've been doing their salaries based on starting position, and they've really, really, really made people pay up for place differential. And yeah, Christopher Bell at nine thousand three hundred dollars, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But at the same time, he's starting thirty sixth. Now, so far this year, Bell has struggled tremendously. I expected him to be great last week. He kind of sucked. Granted, a lot of that could be chalked down to they don't run Martinsville at Xfinity. And even though he dominated at that track type, um, he, he, he did not do great at all. Um, you know, he's, he's struggling alongside his teammates there and really has underperformed a lot this season. He had some spots where he impressed, you know, uh, the first Charlotte race, the 600, he survived to a 10th place finish, 11th at the second Darling, uh, Darlington race. Other than that, no finish better than 18th on the season. And, you know, he has his best average running position at a one and a half mile track this year is that Charlotte race where he's running 14th on average. Not that hot. The thing is, if he, if he, uh, becomes a top 15 or so he's then he's flirting with breaking 50 fantasy points i just don't see that competing against dominators here if there's split domination like i think there will be i think you, you kind of want to go the two dominator route this week uh i don't i don't see paying that much for christopher bell at nine thousand three hundred dollars starting 36th when you could just play cole custer at six thousand over three thousand dollars cheaper, starting thirty fifth. We'll get to him. We'll get to the Uber chalk there later. Um, he's actually the rookie I prefer the least. Maybe you know, maybe Nemechek, and obviously like Quinn Hauff, not so hot. But of the th of the big three, he's probably the one I prefer the least. Even though he's starting back in thirty sixth, so yeah, that's a uh, you know, tough draw for you, Bell. But I'm not. You know, he's just like Alex LeBay and, LeBay and Xfinity. I don't really want to pay up for that this week. I don't think a lot of people will. And I don't think it'll kill you if you uh, ignore him for the most part. Because he would have to do something that he has not shown he's capable of doing yet uh, to really pay off compared to guys around him. Uh, Clint Boyer's at $9,000 here. Usually I wouldn't care for him too much in this sort of position. But this year he has, you know... Despite despite finishing awfully in a lot of these races, you know, average finish to seventeenth, the average running position of eleventh, he he's done all right. Now, granted, one race was just because of the the invert, so I don't care too much about that stupid second Darlington race where he garnered thirty three percent of the dominator points that race. Uh, but Atlanta, he looks solid. He looks really good, Atlanta. Uh, all the other races, not so much. <laughs> no real dominator points for him. That's always been the thing about him. Like, like I said last year, you could have faded him every single race and you would have been uh, really good on the season uh, just doing that because he rarely kills you. Uh, but yeah, this season he's looked like, you know, he's taken a step forward. 28 lead laps per race at these one and a half mile tracks. Of course, a lot of them just because of the field invert. Uh, although, you know, that was, he did kind of earn that, I guess, but... When you've got the the guys who barely struggle to make the top twenty starting top five, you know it's it's no surprise that you can have a weird dominator like that. Um, yeah, he could finish like top five here, and maybe 
I don't know, sneak out some sort of value. Never too thrilled about the Clint Boyer play, and he does seem to find trouble oftentimes, but, you know, I don't know. He's I've been underrating him. I've been player hating on Mr. Clint Boyer. Um, yeah, so I got I gotta give him a little bit of respect, maybe more than I want to initially. Now Ryan Blaney at eight thousand eight hundred dollars. You thought Keselowski was underpriced here. Blaney has been proving constantly this year that he belongs. It is almost equivalent to his teammates already at Penske, but he gets no love from the DraftKings salary department here at eight thousand eight hundred dollars. So. He's been really good this season. What can I say? You know, his last three one and a half mile tracks at Charlotte twice and Atlanta, fourth, third, and fourth. Um, you know, only dominating, you know, not dominating crazy laps. The only intermediate track where he really dominated at was Auto Club. Um, he's, he's yet to go over 5% of the dominator point share in any of these races. Uh, it's just he's so cheap that all he has to do is finish like in the top five, which I think he can. You know, historically has never finished in the top ten here. Usually has problems at this track, uh, but I kind of like fading that angle. Maybe that keeps people off of him. He is twelve to one right now. Is where Boyer is thirty three to one. Even though Boyer looks like he has better finishes here historically, and starting right next to him, um, well, I guess behind him, but still. Actually, he's start. Yeah, he's starting right next to him. But yeah, Blaney, he's just been he's been really slept on this year. I like him at the short tracks a lot. Um, he actually has uh, ten fast laps per race on average here, so he can rack those up. Unlike guys like Boyer, guys like Logano, uh, guys like Kurt Busch, he doesn't really have that problem. And you know. It's not like he just racked them all up in one race. I mean, last year he got 19 fast laps here. Um, so yeah, it's not bad, his numbers there. But he does have, you know, he just has the, uh, he's run into problems, you know, almost every time here. His 11th place finish last year was his best finish uh, by far. Before that, he had never finished better than 17th. But again, ignoring that mostly, his... His driver rating last year at one and a half mile tracks was 88. This year it is at a dead even 100. Looking nice. Looking very, very improved this season. Uh, so for the price, I think Blaney is fine. Not, again, not sure how popular he'll be, just like Keselowski. I imagine he stays pretty popular because he has been very popular. He just paid off as the chalk last week. He was like over 50% owned, but that was on the pole. Um, you know, he's not going to be as crazy high... Uh, owned uh, if he was priced like like Bowman is this week in the lower 8Ks because DraftKings just being silly earlier. But yeah, Blaney, he's a nice little play. I don't like a lot of plays in this range. I'll probably play him if I need to go in this range, but I'll mostly avoid it. Uh, and then Kurt Busch, again, also a guy in this range. Kind of the same analysis of Kurt Busch as I usually have, although um, definitely, I, I don't know, I'm, I feel like I've also been... Uh, kind of underrating him like Boyer because, you know, we, we all got off of him that race that he was sent to do a pass-through penalty and all that, but his car is ridiculously fast. He ended up unlapping himself and ultimately finishing sixth in a very impressive race. Um, yeah, I don't... That, that was at the short track, Martinsville. I don't think that applies too much, but if you look at what he's done at one-and-a-half-mile tracks... Um, he has, he has a really, really good finish, like average finish, right? Uh, not the greatest average running position, but again, he always finds a way to sneak into the top 10. Has not posted a lot of top 10s at this track, but again, he's never in contention, at least rec in recent history. In this generation of car, he's never been in the, uh, uh, the final four in the playoffs, I don't think. His best finish is eighth. Um, again, I think he's going to start 10th, maybe finish like... 9th, 10th, something like that, and he'll get you like 35 to 40 points, maybe if he steals some fast laps, which he usually doesn't, and I don't think it's going to win you anything, so him and Boyer are very similar in my mind. His price is pretty good, though, $8,600, you know, better than he's been priced. Just his ownership, he always comes in over-owned, in my opinion. I don't know why people like Kurt so much. I think it's because they look at his game log, and they're like all top 10s. And they think, wow, that's nice. But he just doesn't have the dominator points for me. It's the same kind of analysis every week.
Speaking of dominator points, this is a guy that people have been sleeping on for a while, and I know he failed us miserably at the last one and a half mile track, but Alex Bowman is $8,400. Of course, everyone knew to get off of them last week at Martinsville, and he actually ended up uh, finishing sixth despite having a bad race, as expected. He stuck up there to a sixth place finish in the end. Um, you know, ninth, he finished ninth year last year. Uh, his only like formidable finish. Here's the thing: uh, at one and a half mile tracks this year, his average running position is eighth. That's uh, second best of anybody behind only Kevin Harvick. His average finish is sixteenth. Um, yeah, so he's definitely been running a lot better than the game logs would show. If you look at the game logs, just looking at finishing position, the last four one and a half mile tracks, he's finished. 12th, 31st, 20th, and 18th. Of course, he won at Auto Club, dominated that. And Kim Brunner up at Darlington also dominated that. But just looking at the stats, you know, the dominator point percentage, I love using that just when evaluating guys. He racked up 19.5% of the fan, of the dominator points at Charlotte, the second race, and 24% in that first Charlotte, or Charlotte race. Of course, went, went off at Auto Club dominating 42% of the dominator points there. Uh, and then 18% of the first Darlington race, mostly coming through fast laps and stuff. But yeah, this year he's uh, he's averaging 35 lead laps, 24 fast laps. And those numbers both come in as number two in the field behind only Kevin Harvick, who's way out ahead of everybody. Uh, so for $8,400, probably looking like a core play there. Hendrick has just looked awesome this year. And, yeah, it's uh, just a really good play, I think. I think a lot of people gravitate there. Um, people have been rostering Bowman a pretty good amount, 20 to 30% at these one-and-a-half-mile tracks, and they know not to play him when you go to the other arrow package. Uh, I think people kind of get the drill by now, and the, yeah, the price is just way too cheap. Now, you've got Kenseth at $8,200. He's definitely a big trap play this week. You know, you look at his finishes since 2013. Didn't race here last year, but uh, from 2018th and onward, uh, no finish worse than 8th. So, you know, crazy consistent there. I don't know how many people are going to look at that and then play him starting 20th. Uh, but clearly, he has not been doing nearly as well. He's had some uh, uh, some pains getting used to this package, getting used to the 42 car. Um, just been really bad. Uh, his best finish is 12th at Charlotte, 12th at Darlington. And those were like ceiling performances for him. Uh, yeah, he's, he's like running in the mid teens for the most part. So he'll move up a few spots maybe. Um, but I don't know. I'm not too huge on Mr. Kenseth here. Uh, hasn't obviously hasn't led a lap and he's really not putting up fast laps uh, just three per race. I don't know. He's okay. I, I might play him a little bit, but not too crazy about Kenseth overall. I uh, got Matt DiBenedetto starting in 23rd for $8,000. Again, not many Dominator points from him. He's in what has historically been the Menard car, the, well, the, well, not historically the Menard car, but uh, the Wood Brothers 21 car, the, the Blaney car, the old Blaney car. So pretty much a Penske car, kind of like how Christopher Bell is to JGR. Um, they have that that partnership there. Uh, last year he had his best finish here, 20th. Of course, again, ignoring most of that. You know, last year at one and a half mile tracks, his average running position was 26th. This year it is 14th. Huge improvements this year, of course. Uh, you know, last week I think he ended up in the optimal on Fanduel, which is kind of crazy. Uh, definitely has top ten potential here. Run finished runner up at Las Vegas, but other than that, his best finish is ninth at Darlington. Um, is hasn't looked that great over the last three one and a half mile tracks, uh, but still starting twenty third for eight thousand. Uh, probably a play that you can get you some of, uh, just to interchange with some of the other plays down here. Uh, you got William Byron at seven thousand eight hundred dollars. 
we don't really know how good he is at this track. He crashed last year in the first race of this package, and rookie season he finished 24th. Uh, I don't, you know, don't care about any of that. I don't even know why I'm even mentioning it at this point. Uh, average running position of 17th so far this season at one and a half mile tracks. Um, average finish of 22.5. Look, he's he's looked all right at times. He has run into some problems, of course, usually at the expense of his teammates. He's had some crashes, some loose wheels, all that. Um, looked a lot better last year at this track type, but, you know, I still think that, um, you know, he's kind of underrated here a bit. I know he's, you know, every time we've seen to pile on him, uh, him, he's disappointed, but his price is so cheap, $7,800, still in Hendrick equipment. Kind of reminds you of Ryan Blaney from the Penske squad. Uh, just cheap. I wouldn't mind squeezing him into some spots. He's starting right next to... D. Benedetto, but he's $200 cheaper, even though he's 35 to 1. D. Benedetto is 80 to 1. And I don't think that Byron's going to win this race by any means, let alone come top 5. But I, I could see him running top 10. He's even, you know, competed for some lead laps here. Uh, just because Hendrick has been, yeah, you know, some of these one and a half mile tracks, they've just been fast as a team. If that's the case again this week. Uh, I, I really don't mind Byron at 7 8. You've got Bubba Wallace at $7,600, starting 17th. Looked amazing last uh, last week. You know, it was definitely the face of NASCAR for a week. It was at a track where he had some experience with two wins in the truck series at Martinsville. And, you know, had top 20 finishes the two races prior there. You know, looked extremely fast. Looked like he should have been a top 10 car. Ended up coming 11th, and that's just because... I think he had a, an issue in pit road. He had like something break in his car that would make his pit stop slower. And you know, but for the most part, he was a top 10 car there. At one and a half mile tracks, though, here's the thing. He's he's starting 17th, but he's like a 20th place car. He's had some good finishes. He's He tends to over finish. Um, I don't know, but I don't see him being a very good play at all. Still just way way overpriced. He should be in the 6Ks or lower. And then he would be kind of fairly priced, I think. I think he's just ridiculously overpriced. Uh, Daniel Suarez underneath him at $7,500. Ridiculously overpriced. I don't know if their algorithm is using previous year's data when he was with JGR, Stuart Haas Racing. Um, Gaunt is not anywhere even near those two teams. Those are two elite teams. <laughs> Gaunt is a scrub team. I don't get this at all. Starting 37th, like he has been pretty much the last like four or five races. Uh, he's, he's maybe like a 26th, 27th place car at best. And he, ha he has like almost no real shot of breaking 30 fantasy points here. Like he would need to finish like 25th to do that. I really don't see that. And even 25 fantasy points isn't going to do anything for you at $7,500. So he's basically unplayable. No one's going to play him. I don't, I don't see his ownership breaking like 5%, if let alone like 3%. All right, so this is this is the play right here. $7,300 Tyler Reddick. Now, Reddick, of course, has won the last two Xfinity championships here at this track. Um, again, I've, all, I've compared Reddick to Larson because they are like, they have so many similarities. Both are extremely talented at running the wall. And, you know, I was watching him when he was doing that. Uh, they started doing this thing on the NASCAR YouTube channel where they have a uh, driver run the race in iRacing before the race and just kind of explain how the track works. Basically said that he doesn't want to go to the outside because he doesn't want to take those risks. But he will if he needs to, and he's one of the absolute best. We saw it all the time in the Xfinity Series. Whenever there's a track that required you to drive the wall, he just, he dominated. He, he's so much better than everyone else at it, unless Larson was in that race. Um, so he's basically mini Larson here. And you saw it at Darlington. You know, there, you need to do something very similar at, at Darlington. And he was like a top, he was a legitimate top 10 car at Darlington. So he's starting back in 24th for only $7,300. I, 
I see him coming top 15 uh, for sure here. He, his average running position is 14th. Average finish 13th at one and a half mile track so far this year. It's not even including Darlington, which is a bit underneath that. I mean, throw Darlington in there. It's even better. Um, but yeah, Redick, my favorite play on the entire board. I know that Custer is going to be the one that everyone goes to because the price is insane, especially in comparison to Bell. But I don't overlook Redick. Stylistically, this is the perfect, perfect track for him. And he's so talented. And he's been so good this year, like legitimately impressive. He's doing stuff that I expected Bell to do. And yeah, perfect at the one and a half. Perfect at the intermediate track so far this year. Worst finish was 18th at Las Vegas. Since coming back from break, 11, uh, he's finished 7th, 13th, 9th, 14th, and 16th at the one and a half mile tracks. And gosh, he's, uh, he's just so impressive. You know, at Charlotte, he ran... You know, a tenth is average running position at the Coke 600. Tenth, insane stuff. In fact, five of the last six races, his average running position has been fifteenth or better. So good. My favorite play on the board, hands down. Uh, so Ricky Stenhouse Jr. now seven thousand one hundred dollars. Big drop off there. Uh, we're starting to see the difference between. Uh, his JTG ride and his old Kenseth machine with Rouse that he gave up this year uh, to Busher. Um, now he has the two top five finishes at one and a half mile tracks this year. That is, that's definitely true. And I like him at steep tracks. I do, but I don't know. He's, he, he's very, whenever there's a risky sort of track like that where you got to be careful, and this is one of those. I don't like Stenhouse because obviously he's one of the least careful drivers there is. That goes all the way back to his Xfinity days. Now, of course, he has won two Xfinity championships at this track. But here, his best finish is 15th. Again, usually a pedestrian. Well, always a pedestrian. He never makes it that far in the playoff run because he can only win at plate tracks. Um, you know, average running position this year of 18th. Starting 19th, so again, just an upside issue here. I don't see him having anywhere near as much upside as Redick. I know that the top five finishes, I mean, of course, you know, there's some crazy upside. If he has one of those, if he pulls another one of those out, I don't think he will. He could, so I'll have a little bit of exposure to him, but I'm generally banking on him not being that fast again. Ryan Newman at $6,900 is starting 14th. Starting a bit high for me, dog, but, you know, came seventh here last year. I, I never doubt his ability to come top ten uh, at a lot of these tracks. Average running position and average finishing position this year of 13.1. Uh, so, I guess expect him to move up one spot. You know, about 10th to 13th, 14th. That's about right. I expect him to run most of this race. And, again, some more upside issue here. Because that'll, that'll put you in the low 30s. You know, and he's not going to rack up fast laps. He's just not going to do that. Averages less than one fast lap per race here, historically. Um, he's just like, you know, he's a miniature Kurt Busch. Very good at running up there. You know, finishes way better than most guys who are 100 to 1. But, again, the, the, GP, the GPP upside ain't there. And the cash safety ain't there. So there's not really much of a place to be playing Newman outside of playing him for low ownership, and he's kind of someone that, you know, gets over-owned oftentimes. Although I don't think he'll be that owned, high owned this week, maybe like 10%, but it's because he's starting 14th. Now you've got Ty Dillon at $6,700. Very expensive price for Dillon compared to how he's usually priced. It's because he's starting 32nd. Here he has a very tight average finish of right in the 22nd to 25th range. That's about what you can expect of him. Does that. Get you like 30 fantasy points. Um, which is fine. You know, good cash play. Love him in cash. Uh, but again, another... I mean, he, of course he can find some upside. Uh, generally, this has not been a high attrition track. But if if there is you know, a lot of attrition here, then you might have to really start considering these place differential plays back here. I don't know about Suarez, but... Uh, Ty Dillon for much cheaper, starting 32nd, you know, if 
we see a big mix-up of guys running into issues and stuff, and Ty Dillon just keeps his head down and you know sneaks into the top 20, That I, that's probably good value right there. Uh, so I don't mind him. I think he has a, he, obviously a very good cash game play, but I think he has his purposes in GPP, and I think his raised price would keep him from being chalky like he has been in the past. Uh, Eric Jones at $6,500. I guess this is just his new price now. Uh, finished third here last year. Did did great. Um, starting 15th. Not as bad as his starting position of uh, the last few weeks where he's finished, or where he started like 13th or so. Uh, so, you know, a couple of weeks ago when he was first put in this like 6K price range, he was crazy chalk. Uh, had a tire cut down. And then everyone kind of got off of him last week for Martinsville, which is a horrible track for him. You know, this track, it's it, we still don't really know how good he is at this track, but, uh, you know, 40 to 1, starting 15th. For, uh, the price is just a little cheap here. Uh, so I like him. Uh, there are, this is, you know, the start of a section where they have a lot of good plays here in the lower 6K range. So you're going to kind of be interchanging some of these guys. Um but yeah, last year, his average finish at one and a half mile tracks was 8.6. Kind of crazy. He's one of the highest, uh, well, one of the lowest average finishing positions in NASCAR. His average running position was 13th. So, I mean, he was kind of over finishing, but um, you know, he has top 10 upside for a $6,000 car. You're not going to find that with many of the other uh, 6K cars. Um, you might find that with Eric Almarola starting at uh, starting back in 21st here, and he's still priced down. So he's been priced down significantly over the last three or four weeks. And I'm sensing that DraftKings is kind of keeping some guys in some general salary ranges. We've seen Eric Jones continually priced down low. Now we've seen Michael McDowell being priced with the scrubs for whatever reason. And we're seeing Eric Almarola just drop each week as nobody plays him because he keeps starting second. And <laughs> that's just awful for him. He's finally not starting second, but he's at like his lowest price ever at $6,300. Uh, finished top 10 here in 2018, although granted that was the year that uh, Stuart Haas Racing was like Super Saiyan overpowered that year. Other than that, no good finishes pretty much ever. Uh, of course, he was in inferior, uh, inferior equipment before, but he had some crashes in 2016, 2015. Uh, Disregard all that. He's starting in 21st. Generally, he's going to have about a 10th to 15th place car uh, just for his ridiculously low price and the fact that he certainly might have top 10 upside. I mean, he has a 7th place finish at Darlington, finished 8th at Auto Club, also uh, finished 12th at the first Darlington race. Does something like that, he's going to almost certainly be optimal. Uh, so I definitely get some shares of Almarola in, just way too cheap. And then at six thousand two hundred dollars, got new daddy, Mister Austin Dillon, who, you know, was a, a source of a lot of drama at Martinsville. You know, we didn't know if he was racing or if Almendinger was racing. Ultimately, we ended up piling in on him, of course, because last minute we kind of, you know, pretty much got the sense that Dillon was gonna race for sure. Uh, so you play Austin Dillon, and then not only does Almendinger not show up to the track for some reason, uh, halfway through the race, he just kind of quits. He is overheated, and I, I absolutely get it. They're racing like three days after a race, and th this is something that the schedule is going to cause with these, you know, these you know, quick back-to-back uh, -back races, you know, three days apart or whatever. It's like... You know, it's like uh, when you're in the playoffs in baseball and you're playing a starting pitcher uh, with just a few days rest. They're doing that constantly with these uh, midweek races. You know, it takes a lot of time to recover from these races. They're uh, very tumultuous, and we're not all that far removed from the dang Coke 600, which is just exhausting. Uh, so, you know, I think Dylan had to uh, go get IVs and stuff. He was damn near passing out. We saw that from a few other drivers, but... Uh, this is a place where his track history is really solid. Eighth last year, and all top 12 finishes going back to 2016, 14th in 2015. He is way overperformed here. And, you know, he's, his average running position is really high at 14th. Um, 
So we're $6,200 starting 16th. Uh, the only thing you got to worry about here is narratives with him. Obviously, he was exhausted and, you know, with the new baby constantly screaming and crying. I definitely know from experience over these last few years, it could be really rough the first few weeks. Very special time. You know, sometimes you like the narrative of uh, new dad strength. And I like that one. Um, not so much in uh, the, the sports like these where it's, it's very physical, um, more physical than you think. And just, of course, with these, uh, you know, the short time period in between races, I'm kind of skittish on using Dylan here. I wish he was starting a little bit farther back, but $6,200 is insanely cheap for him. He is priced like a priest type driver and he, sh he should just be in the 7k so we can just kind of safely ignore him like you would like a Stenhouse or Newman this week. Or maybe just play a little bit of him. But $6,200 kind of forces the issue on you a little bit. Because uh, he's, he's proven that he's very good at this track. Um, so I don't know how much of him I'll have. But I'll definitely have him uh, interchange with Almirola and Jones in several lineups. And that brings us to the chalk. $6,000 Cole Custer. So in the Xfinity series, uh, Cole Custer... He definitely performed a lot better at one and a half mile tracks than any other track type. Uh, was not great at like short tracks, road courses, uh, stuff like that. He definitely did his best work on 1.5s. He has not been impressive this season. A 13th at the Coke 600 is by far his best finish. Outside of that, his best finish, at least at these intermediate tracks, is 18th. He's done that a few times. Uh, that's kind of all he has to do here, though, at 6K. Um, starting back in 35th, that's like, if he, if he finishes like 20th, that's like plus 15 spots. That's almost 40 points for a 6K guy. That's incredible. So, yeah, the, the reason for playing Custer is very obvious. Now, what worries me is he's he has like no fast laps. So it's going to be all place differential. But again, if this is going to be sort of a gong show... I expect there to be a lot of, uh, a lot of, just uh, a big clown fiesta, honestly. I expect that. So, Custer, I mean, a cash lock, obviously. And it's just got to be really hard to fade him because his floor is really freaking high and his price is really freaking low. The only reason you're fading him is because ownership is going to be massively high, if not the highest owned guy. So,. You're kind of banking on a crash from him at a track that, as far as we know, is low caution. Although we do expect the number of cautions to go up uh, this race, just with the uncertainty and lack of practice and all. Um, yeah, that just that that honestly just adds to uh, to his case there. You know, if it's going to be a disaster, you know, if you're building a lineup, hand building a lineup, and just playing a lot of place differential because you're expecting. You know, a bunch of crashes or something. He's definitely going to be a guy you want to throw in there. Um, but you might want to make some lineups for your hand building. Just, you know, make some lineups thinking, okay, maybe this whole thing goes green. We've seen that in this package a lot. Uh, then, you know, maybe you, you'd want to fade Custer then because you might need more than place differential or maybe just underperforms, crashes or something, you know. You just want to be off the chalk. So, um, some very good chalk that you can eat, but... Again, Chalk has not really been the move recently. Now, Corey LaJoy is starting 26th. Um, last race, he had uh, an outlier performance. Now, he has raced here the last three years. Never finished better than 31st. Always been uh, just a scrub getting lapped. Uh, so I expect him to move a little backwards here at 5,800. Um, no real reason to play him, I don't think. I, I really don't see him surprising this is not. I don't think this is going to be a track where he can do that. Maybe it could survive some carnage, but even then, I'd prefer someone starting farther back, like Ryan Priest, five thousand seven hundred dollars, starting thirty third. Uh, actually finished twenty fifth here last year, and back in twenty fifteen, I forget who he was substituting for. Uh, I think it was Matt Kenseth, because he wrecked out Logano and he was suspended or something. I'm pretty sure it was. No, no, that was before then. 
Now, I know it wasn't Kyle Busch. Yeah, it's, it's 2015. I'm trying to remember who he subbed in for. I don't know. I forget. Uh, let me know in Slack if you if you remember. Maybe I'll look it up later. But, yeah, he he actually has experience here from 2015. Uh, but he wrecked out or something, finished 38th, like at the back of the pack. But that, that's interesting to note. Um, yeah, starting 33rd, he's going to be a nice little uh, pivot from Custer for sure. Someone I'm going to definitely work into my lineups, weave in there. Uh, very few actual plays that I like down this range, but he is definitely one of them. Uh, and he's actually gotten fast laps at Homestead. I think he got like five or six fast laps here last year. Uh, so, yeah, it's a really sneaky play there. Then Timmy Hill, he's starting in last in 38th. He's $5,600, so his appeal is pretty much gone because of that price tag. If he was in the 4Ks, maybe. Uh, you might play him in those gong show kind of lineups, but his 66 car has looked really bad this season. Um, I don't see a ton of reason to play Hill. Best finish is 33rd. Um, if he comes 33rd, he's going to get you 16 fantasy points, and I don't think that's going to win you anything. It, I would only play him if you're expecting like a complete clown fiesta. Like That's pretty much it. You got Chris Busher at five thousand five hundred dollars. No love, no love. He's starting thirteenth. That's still a crazy low price. Why is he cheaper than Timmy Hill? Now, one and a half mile tracks were definitely his best uh, track type last year. He had like all top twenty finishes at one and a half mile tracks. Uh, average uh, finishing position of fourteenth last year, but his average running position was twenty first. So. He just found ways to put it uh, better than he had it, straight up. Uh, last week we saw him pay off as uh, your know, real chalk play. is a little bit surprising to me, but I get it. Start, he's starting 24th at this price. Starting 13th at this price is going to be a lot harder for him to pay off, even at his best track type. And It's not like he really gets fast laps or anything. Um, I don't see uh, much upside for him. Even if he finishes, like, say, 15th, which is, like, a ceiling position. That's, like, a ceiling finish for him. He's not even breaking 30 fantasy points if you do that. So I don't see much of a reason to pile on to Busher too much, despite the price. It's, like, I guess the price is okay. But, um, yeah, and you've got uh, John Hunter Nemechek. And, you know, he's, he's uh, started 18th for, like, the millionth race in a row. A lot of these guys keep drawing the same spots over and over. Um Anemacek has been pretty impressive uh, this year. 13th at Charlotte, 9th at Darlington. Has a few good finishes. Other than that, he's like a 25th place car-ish. 25th to 20th. Um, yeah, he's going to go backwards a little bit, I'd imagine. He did race this race last year. It was one of the few races they actually got to race in Cup Series. And he got seven fast laps and finished 23rd. Very impressive. Uh, but... If he does that exact same thing this year, the seven fast laps, finishes twenty third. He gets nineteen point five fantasy points. That is not even. That's not going to do it. He would need to somehow sneak in a top fifteen finish. I don't think that's very likely at all. I am much more likely, of course, to go back to the well with his teammate, who's been just insane for value over the last few weeks when he's been priced crazy low. Uh, a guy that's on currently on a six race top twenty five finish streak at one and a half mile tracks. That's Michael McDowell at five thousand two hundred dollars, starting thirtieth. Uh, the punt chalk, of course. Uh, you could see him in the maybe like up to thirty percent owned or so. He's been very chalky and he's been paying off for people very nicely. Uh, over the last uh, three races here, he averages seven fast laps per race which is insane. I don't know if he just, you know, had an off-schedule pit stop or something, but that is uh that's shocking. He actually finished 10th here in 2016. Crazy, I know. Uh so another cash game lock probably. Uh almost certainly. You know, starting back in 30th, expect him to at least get up to like 25th or so. That he has a very very straightforward route to 30 fantasy points that a lot of these pump plays do not have. They would have to have like ceiling performances, and all McDowell has to do is have an average performance. That's why he's going to be crazy chalk here. Uh, I can't really argue against that. Now we get into the scrub range here, 5K and below. 
An interesting little play here is BJ McLeod. He is starting 34th, right? He's usually in the 78 McLeod car. Uh, but this week, uh, Reed Sorensen's not racing, and he's been in the 77 Spire car that Ross Chastain raced in earlier this season with um, some connections to Chip Ganassi Racing. Uh, the Spire car is a step above a lot of these Rick Ware racing cars that you see at the very bottom of the leaderboards usually. Um, it's usually about a 30th place car. So McLeod's been driving about a 34th, 35th place car. He gets an improvement here. He's starting 34th, but he gets to drive about a 30th place car, which, which has upside to finish like 29th, 28th or so. And if he does that, if he finishes like 29th, that's a pretty decent score. That's 20 fantasy points. I mean, obviously McDowell <laughs> is way better than McLeod. It's just... You know, it's a little sneaky play because DraftKings doesn't show he's in the 77 Spire car. It still shows him in the 78. Uh, so that's just a sneaky little cheeky play that you might throw into a Clown Fiesta lineup or something. The rest of the guys are pretty much irredeemable. Uh, Quinn Half is usually one of the better scrubs, I guess. He's in the old Landon Castle, Jeffrey Earnhardt, uh, double zero Starcom car. About a 31st place car, pretty similar to Brandon Poole. Uh, he's starting 31st, so I don't see any upside for him at all. Joey Gaze is starting 29th. That is hilarious. Uh, bad, bad play. Horrible play. Nobody should own him. I don't. There's no reason for anybody to play him. Uh, Brandon Poole, who has looked uh, like one of the more successful scrubs in the old Chastain number 15, uh, formerly premium, now Rick Ware racing car. Uh, it's a yeah, it's starting 28th and should be about a 30th place car. So. I mean, he's going to get like 10 fantasy points, maybe 12, 14 at best. Uh, I can't really play him. And Josh Balicki started 27th. Horrifyingly bad play. God awful play. <laughs> like the worst play you can make. Uh, and you've got JJ Ailey in the 27 uh, Rick Ware racing car, of course, formerly the premium car there, starting 25th. He is also pretty horrible, but at least he's like decent. He could finish top 30. Blakey is like a 35th place car in the 53 Rick Ware racing car, which is the worst of the Rick Ware racing cars, uh, as I've dug into there. So Blakey got off. A lot of these guys you can just uncheck. I might play like, if you're mass multi-entering, maybe sneak in a little smudge of McLeod. But for the most part, Michael McDowell should be the go-to for everyone if you really need to go down here, which you don't really need to because of guys like Custer, Austin Dillon, Eric Amarola, Eric Jones should be just way too easy to find value here. Just take one of the misspelled Eric's and you're good to go, honestly. And you've got Redick, who I think is a ridiculous value. So value should be no problem. It's about mix and matching the studs that you think are right, taking some stands. And yeah, should, tra uh, should just attack it like you would a normal one and a half mile track. And then maybe... Consider more variants, you know, bump up the randomization percentage on the DS. And yeah, that's how I'm going to attack this week. Again, up top, I like, uh, I mean, Harvick obviously is the ideal play. And then Truex, but I like Elliott. I like Logano. I like uh, Blaney, and I like Alex Bowman. And I think a lot of people should like Alex Bowman. I don't know how many people will actually like Alex Bowman. Ownership is going to be interesting to look at, and... Um, yeah, I don't trust the projected ownership as much this week as I usually would, just being straightforward with you. Uh, it's going to be really hard to predict how the public deals with a lot of plays that I think are really polarizing, especially the Kyle Busch play. So be interesting to see how that all shakes out. DFSArmy.com, promo code TACO. will get you a lifetime 20% off. You can join our Slack, active in there all the time. Really fun during race days. Love the tilt. Love the... Uh, uh, the screenshots from the first stage. <laughs> Loving all that stuff. Uh, we have a fun time in there. You should definitely come check us out. Get access to all our VIP stuff. And then, of course, we have we have coverage of every uh, DFS sport going on. I said DFS sport, which is like saying ATM machine. Oh, well, too bad. DF sport. It sounds weird saying that. I don't know. But anyway, we, we cover it all. You know, so got some League of Legends going on right now, I'm sure. So, um Looking forward to this four races in two days. <laughs> going to be crazy. A lot of action. A lot of bankroll up in the air at once. Uh, it's 
going to be wild. So I wish you guys the best of luck. And uh, yeah, go get some uh, get some winning lineups in. Come put those helmets on the top. And I'll see you guys later.